to see everybody. I'm getting the queue back there. It's time to get started. Uh, we welcome you here tonight, those of you who are able to come out. Uh, today is our uh, first day back to what you might call somewhat a normal. And so we welcome you back to the house of God. And we thank you for those who are tuning in on live stream still tonight. And uh, we want to uh, invite you to worship with us tonight. And so you've got to put up with me again. Pastor's out of town. He's down at the beach this week. And so you pray for him and his family. But we've come tonight. It's been a good day. We've come this evening to worship the Lord. So let's do that. Uh, the words are going to be on the screen here just in a minute. Tommy's going to come and lead us in our first congregational hymn. Tommy, you come, brother. Stand with me, please. Grace greater than our sin. Grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount at port, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled.
I'm standing for prayer this evening. I can continue, as I said, to remember Pastor. She's away this week. Uh, continue to remember uh, Sheila and Haley and uh, their family. And Brother Dean there is uh, Miss uh, Jimmy Lee's went home to be with the Lord this week. And so it's a hard time for them and others. Uh, we want to remember the uh, uh, Pam Carter sent us this this morning, the Show and Dofer family. Uh, they lost their loved one this week. So pray for them. Uh, that God would help them and, and several others that were mentioned this morning. Do you have any tonight that you want to mention we didn't mention this morning? Anybody tonight? Brenda? Pat McPherson, okay. Okay, remember Brenda's sister, Pat McPherson. Anybody else tonight? Sandy? Ruth Farley, okay, we mentioned her this morning, that's right. Uh, Okay, Dennis Oliver. Okay. Oh, okay. So pray for Dennis Oliver. All right. Anybody else? Debbie. Oh, bless her heart. Remember Norma Barr. That's it. Lord. Alexis Dawson. All right. Remember these. Anybody else? Sue, okay, yeah. So let's pray for Sue and her family. Sheila, hey, hey, man. Well, it's good to see Doug and Sheila back in church. Good to be here. It's good to be back. It's it's been uh, it's not been fun for any of us. So, but it, it's definitely good. It's a breath of fresh air to get out. Isn't it? So praise the Lord. We we don't know what we uh, miss until we uh, or we don't know what we take for granted until we uh, not been able to do it. So we need to praise God for that. Anybody else? Dad. Okay, Texas, remember Texas, amen. All right, well, let's look to the Lord in prayer tonight and ask God to help us. Heavenly Father, God, as we come to you tonight, Father, we want to thank you for your goodness, thank you for your mercy. And Lord, as uh, Sheila's testified, Lord, it's so good to be in your house and Father, to be with God's people again. And Lord, that's what you've designed, that's what you've ordained, the house of God, the local church. And so, God, it's a blessing to take our part in it, and, Father, uh, to see the work of God accomplished in and through it. So, Lord, we thank you to be here. We ask you to help our pastor this week as he's away and his family. Lord, give him the rest and comfort that only you can bring. And, Father, help them to be restored and revived and come back refreshed. And, Lord, we ask you uh, to meet the many requests that were mentioned tonight. We pray for our lost people, God. Uh, Lord, that you'll speak to the hearts, Lord, of those who are lost. And, Lord, during these times of trouble and tribulation, Lord, that our hearts would be awakened and the, uh, the, the lost would be awakened to their need of Christ. And so, Father, help us to be the examples and the witnesses that you've called us to be. And so, Lord, help us with that. And, Father, we pray for the many uh, sick requests that was mentioned for Pat McPherson and, and uh, Lord, for Dennis Oliver and then for uh, Ruth Farley and and, uh, and uh, Sue Goodwin and these others that were mentioned. And, Father, Alexis and, Lord, uh, and for Texas and, Lord, and for Norma. And, uh, Lord, we don't mean to uh, leave any of them out, but, God, we ask you to meet each one, be with each need and those that were mentioned this morning. And, Father, we pray that your hand to be upon them. And, Lord, many unspoken requests, God. We ask you to meet the need there. And so, Father, we just come to you as a needy people. But, Father, we're so thankful to have the privilege and access of prayer through the blood of Christ. So, Lord, help us tonight as we assemble together to worship you, to praise you in spirit and in truth. So help us to do that. Be with us as we preach the word of God. And, Father, we need your help tonight. And, Lord, I pray that our people will be awake and aware, Father, to the deception of the devil that's on the rampage in these days. So, Father, help us tonight. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. And amen. All right, girls, if y'all say. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come I come just as I am soul of one dark blot 
I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. Just as I am, I would be lost. But mercy and grace, my freedom bought. And now to glory in your cross, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. All right, if you'll stand with me, please, and let's sing Amazing Grace this evening. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shine.
started practicing kind of like they should, and they wanted uh, uh, me to try to help them with it, and uh, we're going to try to do that. Uh, but I taught the preacher in that song, and that's not the name of it. It's called The Highway to Heaven, so you pray for us. The old preacher man stood there in the pulpit. The church house was empty almost. His eyes filled with tears, his mind filled with memories of not so long ago. When the church house was full, not one pew was empty, the altar was stained with saints' tears. As he stands there this morning and sounds out the warning, once again letting them know there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. The way is still straight, there's a race to be run, you can live as you please, but you must pay the cost, and the highway to heaven. goes by the cross some of his members thought he was old-fashioned unwilling to change with the time so they found other churches more modern day preachers who were willing to let things go by but the old preacher stood for what he believed in and what he had preached for these years. As he stands there this morning in a near empty church house, his opening remarks are these words. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun the way is still straight there's a race to be run and you can live as you please but you must pay the cost and the highway to heaven still goes by the cross. Now the old preacher man stands there in that city, the city he's preached of so long. Oh, but he's never seen such a great congregation all gathered, gathered to welcome him home. And he's never heard more beautiful singing that is coming from the heavenly band. He's preached his last sermon, he's carried his last burden, he's at rest in that heavenly land. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. The way is still straight. There's a race to be run, and you can live as you please, but you must pay the cost, and the highway to heaven still goes by the cross. 
you can live as you please, but you must pay the cost in the highway to heaven still goes by the cross. <clears throat> They're scraping the bottom of the barrel to ask me to help them soon. They're very desperate. All right. So get your Bibles tonight, and we're going to kind of pick up where we left off this morning, uh, talking about these days of deception. Let me get wired up here uh, right now. The days of deception, that's what we've been talking about. And uh, we began saying that there's going to be an increase in demonic activity in the days that, uh, but prior to the rapture of the church and then uh, leading up to the coming of the Antichrist. Of course, as we said this morning, that every child of God that has trusted Jesus Christ will not be here for that. We're leaving uh, we're looking for Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. And so, but there's going to be an increase in demonic activity, just like it was in the days when Christ preached upon this earth and he walked upon this earth as Satan trying to hinder the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's going to be the same in these days. And then we began this morning where we're going to pick up this evening. And not only is there going to be an increase in demonic activity, there's going to be an increase in the propagation of false doctrine. And just by way of review real quickly this morning, we said at the base of every false religion and every, uh, every cult that there's two primary beliefs at the base of every false religion. Number one, they deny the work and the person of Jesus Christ that he is God come in the flesh. Later, we're going to go to the book of 1 John and John's going to give us the acid test to tell whether a spirit is a spirit of truth or the spirit of error. And the answer to that is if they claim that Jesus has come in the flesh, that God is come in the flesh and that Jesus is God. And so they deny that. And then number two, the second thing at the basis of every false religion is the work salvation. They deny the blood of Christ. They deny faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross of Calvary. They say you have to do this or not do that. They add to that. Those two things are at the base of every false religion. And so tonight we're going to continue this study of how we are to identify false doctrine and these false prophets. And just as we said this morning that... In the days of old, the great men of God, the prophets of old, Elisha and Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesied about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in these last days, Satan is going to send out his prophets into the world and send his spirit out of this world, preparing the way of his Antichrist who is going to deceive many. So let's look this evening. We're going to go to Matthew chapter number 7, pick up where we left off this morning. We're going to go to the book of Matthew. Jesus tells us how to identify these false prophets. And this false doctrine they teach. So we're going to dwell on a little bit of this tonight and look at some other scriptures. Look in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 15. This is Christ speaking. He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you. Now remember we said this morning that the first attack of Satan on the church was from the outside. He tried it through Nero and these others who persecuted the church and through these religions that, that persecuted the church down through all these years and the martyrs whose blood has stained uh, the many of a post and many have uh, been burned to death and many were drowned for their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we see that that didn't work too well for Satan for the more that he persecuted the church from without, the more that it grew, the more that the gospel spread and that's how it got to all the corners of the earth. But Satan's attack recently has been within. And he's done a greater job attacking within than he did without. So Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which shall come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And so they have an agenda. They have an agenda as they come. They come on the outside calling themselves Christians, calling themselves preachers, saying that they stand for truth, but on the inside their heart is not right. They are the working of the devil. They are empowered by Satan. They are led of him, led by his spirit of Antichrist. And they are ravening wolves. Their purpose and their agenda is to destroy the true work of God. But I'm glad that Jesus made a promise in Matthew chapter number 16 that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church because it's built upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But he says, Beware of these false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, and inwardly they are as ravening wolves. And so they come to you on the outside appearing as sheep. Now remember, Jesus told us in John 10 that my sheep know me and they hear my voice and follow me. And so Jesus many times refers to his children, his people, as sheep. And so the false teachers, the false prophets, and we're going to read this here again in the book of Corinthians here in a moment, they appear as the other sheep. But down deep, there's a deeper agenda to them. Look in verse 16. Notice what Jesus says, And ye shall know them by their fruits. And so Jesus says we can know them, that we can identify them, those of us who know the truth. And, and really the whole underlying theme of these series of messages that I'm trying to preach is that the best and the greatest defense against deception is truth. And so Jesus says you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And a good tree, notice this, cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And so the end time will tell, and their fruit will give them away. When you go to an apple tree, you're going to find apples. It gives it away. You may not know what it, looks, uh, what it is by the bark and the leaves, but I promise you one thing, when that apple begins to grow on that tree, you're going to say, hey, that's an apple tree. And anybody in the right mind is going to know that it's an apple tree. But that's a good fruit. But the Bible said that these false prophets and this false doctrine, you're going to tell them by the fruit that they bear, and it's going to be rotten and stinking corrupt fruit. For notice what Jesus says in verse 19. And every, good, and every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's going to be their judgment. Notice again what he says in verse 20. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. And so Jesus tells us to beware that they're going to come on the inside. And can I submit to you that in these last days and the last couple hundred years that the devil has done a magnificent job of infiltrating our churches. And many are deceived and the devil doesn't come to us. He wants you to believe that he's just this rigged character that comes out on Halloween night with a pitchfork. That's what the devil wants you to believe about him. But the devil, the meanwhile, that as we've been looking for a devil like that, he's been slipping in through the doors of our churches. He comes in. Now, we have talked about this and we know and understand this, that no saved person can be inhabited by a devil. But they can be influenced by one. And the devil will use whoever he can. He tried to get at Peter. Jesus says, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like we. But Jesus said, I've prayed for thee. So the, uh, Satan will, will get to whoever. Now, the devil can inhabit a lost person because they're not indwelt by the Spirit of God. But the reason that it's impossible for a demonic presence or a demon itself or Satan himself to enter a lost or a saved person is because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. That's how we know that Judas was never part of the original 12. Jesus said he wasn't. But the Bible tells us that that night that Judas betrayed Jesus, that Satan himself entered into Judas, telling us that he's not one of the apostles. And so Jesus says, by their fruits you shall know them. And of course, uh, just like with Judas, his fruit gave him away in the end. Let's go now to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and we're just doing a Bible study. And we're looking at a lot of these scriptures because it, it doesn't matter what I say, but it does matter what God says about a subject. And there is much in the New Testament about this subject of false prophets and false doctrine preparing for the last days. Do you know that every second book in the New Testament deals with the last days? Every second book in the New Testament, at some point in time it's mentioned in every second book in the New Testament about the last days. And so I believe if the Lord put that much important on the last days and the working of Satan in these last days, it's important for us to see what God wants us to know. How will we be able to identify them if we don't know the truth? How will we be able to recognize false doctrine if we don't know the true doctrine? That's the comparison. That's the yardstick. You know, I've heard people say this and and it bothers me that they want their children exposed to false teaching so that they can go back and correct them. That, that's not a true statement. That's not a correct statement biblically. We need to expose our children to truth. Then they'll be able to sort out the false doctrine. There's no way in this world that we can expose our children to every false doctrine that is out there. I've read it like this. I, I, like, I was reading that book after uh, John Phillips I was telling you about this morning and and uh, he says there was a captain once on a ship. And there was a man standing beside the captain and one of the passengers of the ship. And he looked off in the distance and they could, see some, uh, they could see some shoals, which is shallow water. 
And the man looked at the captain kind of worried and he said, Sir, he said, do you know where all the rocks are and the hidden reefs in this ocean? And he says, no, sir, I don't know. But he says, what I do know is I know where the deep water is. He knew the path to go. Now, we don't know every rock that Satan is hiding under, but what we need to prepare our children with, what we need to prepare ourselves with is in the truth. We need to stay in the deep water. Lest we become shipwrecked, as Paul would say in the book of Timothy. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, again, Paul is going to write here some indicators. We're looking at how that we can identify this false doctrine and these false prophets as they come because the Bible teaches there's going to be an increase in the propagation of false teaching and false doctrine. And this is all leading up to this great falling away that we read about in 2 Thessalonians 2 this morning. And we're going to talk about that after this point. We get through the, uh, the false doctrine, the false teachers. We're going to go on and look at the apostasy and those who are going to be most susceptible to falling away. But let us look what the Word of God says. And I'm glad that God has given us a guide. I'm glad that God has not left us without the truth, but He has given us the truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3, let's read here. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility. Now remember, we read that this morning again, the principle of first mention, the first time that Satan is mentioned in the Word of God is in Genesis chapter number 3, and he's a deceiving, lying, subtle serpent. And that's the, what we find him in seed form in the Word of God, and he begins to unfold as we study the Word of God. And so Paul is directly in line with the teaching of the Word of God concerning Satan. For notice what Paul says, that he beguiled Eve, he was a serpent, and he was subtle. Is that not what Moses penned about the devil in Genesis chapter 3? That he was a deceiving serpent, he defied the Word of God, he beguiled Eve, and he was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he said, so that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, church, the gospel is very simple. I'm glad that Jesus made it that way. I love what Brother Kirk Copeland says, that, that he put the cookies on the bottom shelf where everybody could get to them. And he had to put them down there for me because that's where I needed them. The gospel is to whosoever will. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, educated or uneducated. You don't have to have a degree to be saved. You don't have to have money to be saved. You don't have to be intellectual to be saved. You just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul said, don't be moved away from that simplicity that is in Christ because the gospel is very simple. That Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again the third day, and he's coming back again. That's the gospel message. And the truth is very simple. God made it that way for us to understand, to give us light. But here's what the world tries to do. Here's what the false prophets try to do. Here's what the devil tries to do is to try to make the gospel more complicated than what it really is. Oh, you have to do this. Just like we've been talking about in the book of Ephesians that the, the Jews were trying to put this heavy burden of circumcision and keeping the law on the Gentiles. You have to add to it. You have to do this. You have to do that. Remember, at the base of every false doctrine and every cult is a works religion. They deny the person and work of Christ and if they can deny the person and work of Christ in their minds, they can come with a new and other way. But Paul said, do not be removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. Was not God's instruction to Adam and Eve very simple and very clear? Simply it was this, you can eat of every tree in the garden except for the one. That, that's pretty easy even for a West Virginian to understand. You can eat of every tree of the good, uh, in the garden but except the one tree. But he said, the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's pretty simple. That's pretty self-explanatory. You don't need a commentary on that. You don't need to go ask the local scholar about that. It's what thus saith the Lord. Very simple. And I'm glad God makes it simple. And so the gospel, Christianity, faith is very simple. But that's why the world rejects us because it's so simple. The man with the PhD, the atheist, the agnostic says, it cannot be that easy. It has to be deeper than that. And you're foolish to believe if it's that simple. But Paul said here, don't be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another... Now, I want you to notice verse number 4. This is going to be one of the identifiers of the false prophets. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus... Oh, yeah, they preach another Jesus. They preach a Jesus 
but it's not the same Jesus of the Bible. And whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, now notice this, they preach another Jesus, and they have another spirit. You mean to say, Brother JP, there's more than one Holy Spirit in this world? Well, there's only one Holy Spirit, but there's more than one spirit in this world. We're going to get to the book of 1 John later, and he's going to tell us how to identify those spirits. But he says, they preach another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or notice what he says here, another gospel, which have not been accepted, ye might well bear with him. And the last part of that verse, Paul, Paul is kind of speaking ironically. Paul says, if somebody else would come to you, he's talking to these Corinthians, who they've been led aside, they've been deceived, and, and Paul is having to correct and deal with some issues here in the book of 2 Corinthians. He's defending his apostleship here, and he says, if somebody else would have come to you and preached another Jesus with another spirit that had another gospel, Paul is speaking ironically here. He said, you would have bore with them, or you would have believed them. But Paul said, no, the gospel is very simple, and there's only one Jesus. And there's only one Holy Spirit. And there's only one gospel by which a man can be saved. And the false doctrine and the false teaching that's floating around, that's rampant in our world today, well, number one, they preach another Jesus. And the Jesus that they preach, oh, he's a great man. He's a wonderful man. He's a good man. And do you know this Jesus that we preach, that, that he was just like any other man, and you know what? He attained a level that no other man could attain. And so in that sense, he is God-like. That's the other Jesus that the false doctrine preaches. But they totally deny that he's God come in the flesh, that he's the God-man, that he's 100% God, that he's 100% man. And he came to this life. He laid aside his robes of glory. But when Jesus came to this earth, he did not lay aside his deity. He still spoke to the winds and the waves, and they obeyed his voice. He healed the leper. He healed the blind man. He spoke to the demons and they trembled at his feet. He was still very God. The demons and the devils have more sense than most people do today. Every demon that Jesus encountered fell at his feet and they begged him not to throw, him into, throw them into torment. And so Paul would say they preach another Jesus. Oh yes, we'll lift him up as a man. Oh yes, we'll put him among the other men as Buddha and Allah and Muhammad and all these. But let me tell you, the, Paul, the, the Jesus that Paul preached was not that Jesus. As Peter said, Jesus would ask them in Matthew 16, Who do men say that I am? And they said, Some say that thou art Elias or one of the prophets. But then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, But who do you say that I am? And this is one of the tests against all the false religions. Who do you say that Jesus is? And Peter got it right this time. Peter was getting it wrong a lot. Peter was getting the cart in front of the horse a lot like you and I do sometimes. But Peter got it right at Matthew 16. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter got it right. That's who Jesus really, that's the Jesus that Paul preached. Paul said, I saved not to know anything among you except Jesus and him crucified. None of the rest of it matters. But what do you do with Jesus? But notice this. Jesus, I want you to hold your place in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's go back to the book of Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is giving his Olivet Discourse. And he's talking about these last days. He's preparing his disciples for the last days. And so Paul was mentioned in 2 Corinthians that they preach another Jesus. But this is exactly what Christ told us in Matthew 24. Look in verse 24, Matthew 24, 24. Jesus said, now he's given his disciples indications of these last days. He says, for there shall arise false, what? Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man be. You're going to know when Jesus comes back. The world is going to know. They're not going to see him at the rapture. But the Bible teaches us in the book of Revelation chapter 1 and the book of Zechariah that every eye shall see him. And they who pierce him are going to wail because of him. And they're going to know who Jesus is. So don't be believing 
people when they say, hey, we have another Jesus over here. Jesus said, don't follow them. You stick with the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And don't be led aside by another Jesus. That's what they preach. It's one of the tests about any false religion. I had some of the Jehovah false witnesses. I don't like to call them Jehovah witnesses because they're really not witnessing for Jehovah. But the Jehovah false witnesses come to my house one day, and man, they, they, they come in full force. There was four of them. You ever notice that they're always from out of state? They don't send anybody local. And so this group was from Florida, and we live out in the middle of kind of nowhere, and if anybody comes down our driveway, they're probably lost. And so I knew somebody from Florida. I said, I believe I know what's happening here. And so they come, and, and boy, they were smooth talking now. I don't encourage you to keep a conversation very long with them. But put them to the test. You try, if you don't believe it's true, put every false religion to the test. Back them into a corner and corner them with the word of God. Now be very careful. They're very good at what they believe and what they know and what they've been taught. So you better have a foundation of truth. And so he began to talk, this man. He was very nice and these three others that were with him. And he began to say, oh, brother, we, we're, we're on the same lines. We believe the same thing. I said, oh, really? And he had his Bible. I said, by the way, what Bible do you have right there? Oh, this is the New World Translation. I said, well, strike one right there. I said, I stand on only the King James Bible. I said, we're not on the same ground already. Oh, but brother, we believe the same thing, and we believe about Jesus, and, and, all, and he goes on to this conversation about Jesus. I said, well, let me ask you this. And I said, this conversation is probably going to be over pretty quick. I said, who do you say Jesus is? Well, he, 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 he was a son of God. A son of God is what they say. I said, well, is Jesus Jehovah the Old Testament? Oh, oh, no, sir. Oh, no, sir. I said, well, can you show me and prove to me that he's not? Because I can prove to you that he is. Oh, well, and he goes, and it tripped him up. And, I, and finally, as John said, you need to, to bid him farewell. Not Godspeed, but bid him farewell and say, you need to leave. But that separated the, the conversation right there. Oh, he was nice. He was very smooth. He was very subtle. But I said, Who, what do you think about Jesus Christ? Who is Christ? Is he God? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. The basis, and that's not just them, but the basis of every false religion, they deny that Jesus is God. So they preach another Jesus. Notice back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, there's another spirit. Now, look with me. Hold your place there. And we're going to kind of uh, skip here just a minute. Go over to 1 John chapter 4. We're not going to, we're going to get into this in a little bit more detail later. But I want you to read this in 1 John chapter 4 because it ties in with this. So notice the false doctrine, the false teachers that are going to come. We're going to see an increase of the propagation of false doctrine prior to the coming of the Antichrist and prior to the coming of the Christ, the rapture of the church. They're going to preach another Jesus, but they're also going to have another spirit. They're going to be influenced and led as another spirit. Just as you and I are influenced and led by the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're saved, you know what I'm talking about. The sweet, precious Holy Ghost of God speaks to our heart. He leads us. He guides us in truth. He leads us in the right way. But in that same sense, in a false sense of the way, remember, Satan has a counterfeit for everything that God has good. And this spirit of Antichrist is going to be indwelling them. It's going to be leading them. It's going to be guiding them, not in truth, because remember, the devil is 180 degrees out of phase with God. Brother Randy could probably tell you a whole lot more about electricity and being out of phase than I can, but I do know this. When your phases don't match in electricity, you have big problems, don't you, Randy? You have major problems. And the devil is always 180 degrees out of phase with what God is doing. He has a counterfeit. He has a counterfeit preachers. He has a counterfeit Bible. He preaches a counterfeit Jesus, a counterfeit gospel, and has a counterfeit spirit. Everything that God has ever intended for good, Satan has a counterfeit for. Marriage, the home, Everything, you can look at everything that God has ever created or meant for good and Satan has a counterfeit or substitute. But notice what John would say in 1 John 4, 3, and we'll be back into 1 John 4 later. But he said, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard and that it should already come and even now already is in the world. And so John, one of the last apostles that we said this morning, lived toward the later end of the first century. All the rest of them have been martyred. He's the only one that will die a natural death. He's exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And John says in his day, at the close of the first century, that the spirit of Antichrist was already at work in the world. And so they have another spirit empowering them. 
My friends, church, don't be deceived by everything you see and everything that's labeled Christian. Can I tell you today that there's another spirit out there operating? God is not working through men, blowing on people and knocking them down, doing hula hoops and somersaults, somebody laying on the floor, flopping like a fish. Now, I, I don't, and I, I'm probably walk, walking on dangerous ground here, but I'm trying to be very cautious. And I'm trying to stay in the bounds of the word of God. You better be careful because every spirit out there is not the spirit of the Holy Ghost of God. And people, and the devil knows this, that people will be more susceptible to believe something that they can see on the outside visibly than to believe the working of the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of a person. If other people can see it on the outside getting stirred up. And I'm not just talking about one particular denomination. I've seen it. And independent so-called fundamental Baptist churches. Young man, a while back we was at a conference. And this young man, I mean it was getting good. And I believe in praising the Lord. And I know when the Spirit of God shows up. And, and I believe in being free to worship God and praise the Lord. So don't, don't get me wrong when I'm saying there. But I believe there's a lot of flesh driven worship. And this young man began to run around the church and carry on and run a lapse. And he goes up and jumping out and he was drawing attention away from the message that he was singing at the time and he's drawing attention to himself. That's flesh-driven worship. And I'm not here to condemn and criticize people. I'm here to warn you. I'm trying to be kind about this and I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else but I'm preaching from the word of God that Jesus said, that John said, that Paul said that there's another spirit out there in this world. And understand and know, child of God, that the devil tries to imitate everything that God does. And so I've been in the real services where the Holy Ghost has really been moving. And men and women have been under the conviction of God. And I've been in this place here at many meetings and camp meetings where the Spirit of God has come down. I felt the sweet Spirit of God in this place this morning. And man, I tell you what, I was almost ready to go run a lap. But I'm telling you, it's real. But there is a false spirit out there. And people will be more apt to see something on the outside and be drawn to that than to just believe by faith and receive the way the Holy Spirit works. That's all I'm simply saying. Notice what he also says. There's another gospel. You see, the gospel of these false prophets, they preach this other Jesus. But remember, we said at the basis of all these false doctrines, it's a works salvation. you got to do this. You have to do this. You have to keep the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to read from our book. Let me caution you very carefully. Any religion or denomination that has an extra biblical source of information is a cult. Every one of them. The Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, and then uh, Taz, Charles Taz Russell, the Watchtower, all those things. I'm telling you, they're cults. And we could go on a name, and I'm not here to throw stones, but any person or any religion or denomination that teaches something apart from the inspired word of God is a cult. That they believe that. They hold it to be true. Now, don't get me wrong. I love to read. And I, I thank God here the last few years. I've been full-time in the ministry. I get paid to sit in my office and study the word of God. I love it. And I love to read books. And I love to read after godly men. But I dare not ever take the words of a man as gospel. There's good words, there's encouraging words, they bring out good thoughts. But at the end of the day, I'm sticking with this. Because they preach another gospel, a gospel of works. And we said this morning that using the principle of first mention, that Cain was the very first false religion mentioned in the Bible. And Abel did it right, he brought the sacrifice, he did it God's way. You see, you can't get to heaven your way. You can't make it work your way. So many have tried and so many have failed and so many are burning in hell today because they tried to do it their way. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that's where Cain's at now. You see, Abel made it into Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter, because he did it right. He did the simple way. God said, you bring a lamb. God said, I require a sacrifice to atone for your sin. And Abel just simply believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness and he makes it into Hebrews chapter 11. You read about Cain in the book of Jude that he's listed among the apostates, that he has his own place reserved in hell. Why? Because he tried to do it his own way. He had a work salvation. You see, in man's eyes, in man's mind, what Satan wants you to believe is that 
just believing that Jesus died on the cross and, and that you ask him to come into your heart and say, that's too simple, there's got to be more to it. You see, that's always man's agenda. There has to be more. I have to do this or I have to do that. But Paul said, no, it's of grace that it might not be of works. He said it's either of works in the book of Romans or it's of grace. It's one or the other. It can't be two, but it's by faith. And so man, humans, and many so-called scholars today say that it has to be more than that. Do you realize that we quoted some statistics last week that there was a lot of people that call themselves Christians and preachers that don't even believe that there's a real heaven, a real hell, and even a real Jesus or a real devil. They believe it's all just some mystical feel-good thing. And these are people who call themselves preachers. And I dare say there's probably some of this community that label themselves preachers that preaches this good works religion. It's not in the Bible. So Paul said to beware. For notice, let's go over to verse number 13 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles. Now Paul here in this chapter is defending his apostleship. There were those who had come into the church of Galatia and the church of Corinth that were trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ and that were attacking Paul. And, and boy, I, I like the way Paul answers it in the book of Galatians. We don't have time to go there. But Paul says, here's what separates me from the false teachers. He said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. You look up that word marks and it means five things. I don't have time to preach that right now. But Paul was branded as a slave, as a criminal, as an outcast. You look up all those things and Paul said, here's the proof. And he, a matter of fact, he goes on to talk about it. In this chapter, he, he would talk about later in verses 22 down to the end of the chapter. We don't have time to read it all. That's the proof of Paul's apostleship. He said, I've been shipwrecked. He said, I've been abandoned. He said, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. That means he was beat 195 times if you multiply that out. Thrown to the beast of Ephesus. Paul was preaching a real Jesus. As a matter of fact, all of these apostles that were true apostles of Christ. You see, one of the requirements to be an apostle in the book of Acts was that they had to see the resurrected Lord. And that's why Paul would refer to himself in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I'm one born out of due time. Paul didn't see him originally with the other 12, but Paul met him on the road to Damascus. And he saw Christ brighter than the noonday sun. He, met, he had an encounter with Jesus. So he saw, and many times Paul would talk about in the book of Acts that the Lord showed up and was with him and talked to him. So Paul saw the Lord. But that was a requirement to be an apostle. You see, we're disciples today of Christ, but we're not apostles. It was the apostles that were given the signs. It were the apostles that were able to speak in tongues. It was the apostle that was able to do the miracles because the Bible says the Jews required a sign. And so to them were given these apostles to prove. Just like Jesus did the miracles to prove that he was the Son of God, he also empowered his apostles to perform the miracles that they might prove that they were the, the first witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I like it. We're going to get to this in the book of Ephesians. I'm kind of jumping ahead here. But I like what uh, Dr. John Phillips wrote about this. He said, you know, when the people come in, you're building a house, and they lay the footer, those people that dig the footer and they pour the concrete, after their job is done, they're not needed anymore. You need the framers and the roofers and the finishers on the inside. Their job is done. And just like that foundation layers, these apostles were, and we're going to talk about that in the book of Ephesians, that's why they were given the, the gifts. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that these things will cease because they were the apostles. They were the first witnesses. It was committed to them to begin to propagate the gospel into all the corners of the earth. And they had these powers. But now we're the disciples and followers of Christ. And Peter said that we have a more sure word of prophecy that we would do well to take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place. You have to understand they didn't have the completed canon of scriptures that we have the privilege to hold in our hand today. It was still a work in progress and God was going to use these men to write it. And so there's other apostles. So I would caution you to be very aware and to stay away from anybody that claims to be an apostle. They're not. We're disciples and followers of Christ, no doubt, but we're not apostles. Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. See, the devil's working from the inside. Remember, Jesus said they'll be like sheep 
but inside they'll be like ravening wolves. They're going to come on the inside. Notice the word deceitful. That's what we're talking about, the days of deception. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, into the ministers of Christ, into the preachers, into the teachers, into the Christian leaders. But boy, I like what uh, 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 Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say all the time. He says, don't give Christian recognition to somebody that's not Christian who's not in line with the Word of God, who's contrary to the Word of God. Don't give that person Christian recognition because they don't deserve it. They're false apostles. They transform themselves or they uh, metamorphosize into what would look like a, a gospel preacher. In verse number 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And so if their master Satan can do it, he's going to empower them to do it. You see, just as we reflect, as we should reflect as the ministers of Jesus Christ, our job is to point people to Christ. Our job is to bring glory to Jesus Christ. But the job of the false prophet, the job of the false teacher, the job of the false preacher is to point people to Satan. It's to glorify Satan. And no, no, no mystery because that's what Satan is, an angel of light. Look in verse 15. Therefore... It is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to what? Their works. Is that not what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7? By their fruits you shall know them. Let the fruit grow. You remember the parable that Jesus taught about the, the, the tares and the wheat. The enemy came by night, and in that parable, Jesus is the, the husbandman of the, the house or the Lord or the master of the house. And you remember the enemy came in by night. That was Satan and sowed the tares among the wheat. Now back in those days, wheat was a valuable possession. They didn't have the Walmarts. They didn't have the luxuries that we had today. And so what you ate, you had to grow. It. And so the enemy came in deceptively by night. And by the way, that's always the way the devil does. He comes low key, comes at night. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. And he planted, he didn't uproot the wheat, but here's what the enemy did. He planted tares among the wheat. There's a weed over there in Palestine that's called, I think it's called the Darnell weed, and it looks exactly like wheat, especially in the young stages. And so in this story, the servant comes out the next day, and the servant is a picture of us, the disciples of Christ. He comes out the next day and looks in the field and said, he began to accuse the Lord and the master said, you sowed bad seed in your field. And the Lord was real quick to correct him. You see, the Lord, it's impossible for the Lord to sow bad seed. The Bible says that we're born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And so he began to accuse the master that you planted bad seed. And the master, which is a picture of the Lord, sets the servant straight. And I'm glad the Lord sets us straight. Sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and... We think we know everything, and sometimes we think we got it all figured out. Sometimes the Lord, the master, has to straighten us out, don't he? But he said, no, this is the Lord knew exactly what happened. The enemy came by night and planted these. You see, as this Darnell weed begins to grow alongside of the wheat, the roots begin to entangle the roots of the wheat. And the danger is the servant, he just jumped off at the mouth and said, shall we pull the tares up? And the Lord said, no. You see, the Lord knew what was going on and he had the answer and he knows about all this before it happened. He says, no, don't pull it up because the danger was if they pulled the weed up, the, the, the darnel, the tear, if they pulled that up, its roots was wrapped around the weed and both would be destroyed. And it wasn't time for the harvest yet. They hadn't bore the fruit yet. You see, over time, the harvest bears fruit. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 15, he said, you're to bear, uh, there's a threefold progression in John 15. He says he wants you to bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. And that's what God is trying to do in every one of our lives, for us to bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. We never get to a place where we're finished. And so the master said, no, let's wait till the harvest. Let's wait till the end. And he says, because if you pull them up now, both will be destroyed. And the lesson is, that we as preachers and as people in the church of the living God, the true believers, the wheat, if we begin to go through the congregation and try to pull tares out, we're going to destroy the crop. Because I can't see your heart. You can't see my heart. And God didn't give any preacher the responsibility to go through and begin to tell people that you're saved and you're not saved. 
Jesus said, and the principle that he's teaching is the same principle he's teaching in Matthew 7, and the end, their fruit is going to give them away. And so at the end of the harvest, it's collected, and at that time, the, the wheat is going to do all that it's going to do. It's done bloomed, it's done produced, and the wheat will be gathered and placed into the barn, which is a picture of heaven, and the tares are going to be gathered up, and they're going to be cast into a pile to be burned. And so are these false apostles. That's what he's talking about here. Their end shall be according to their works. And by their fruits you're going to know them. So we can tell, we can identify by the fruit of what they teach and the fruit of their ministries and what they're trying to propagate. That's about all the time we're going to have here tonight. But next Sunday evening, pastors, I think, let me continue this on Sunday evening. We're going to pick up and we're going to go to 1 John then. We talked about a lot tonight. But we're going to continue this, but understand this, there's going to be an increase in the propagation of false doctrine and false prophets preparing the way for the coming Antichrist. But I'm glad, listen to me tonight, if you're not saved, maybe you're tuning in, you don't know Christ, know this, that our master could come back at any moment. And I believe that I know that the people that are getting saved now are just what's going back through the harvest field and being gleaned. I believe the big harvest has already taken place and we're just gleaning the corners of the field. Getting that one here and there that's getting saved, getting ready to go home. And when that last person is saved, the Lord in His time, only God the Father knows is going to blow that trumpet and come back. And we're leaving out of this place and it could be tonight. But my dear friend, are you ready to meet Christ? Are you ready to step into eternity? For we said this morning, if you miss Jesus Christ in the rapture, it's too late for you. You've had the opportunity, you've heard the gospel, you've had that privilege to be under the preaching of the word of God. Don't take that for granted. Don't take advantage of that, the spirit of God. But come to Christ. If there's things in your life that need to be made right, get that right tonight. But child of God, what we're trying to teach and trying to prepare you for is to stand on truth. Know the Bible. Not just know, and here's why I'm afraid we're guilty, and I'm not going into another message. But oftentimes, we kind of pride ourselves sometimes in a false sense of pride. Oh, we know what to say and we know what we believe. And we could go through the, the, the church doctrine, we could go through the, the Constitution, and we could go through all the things and go through the acrostic, what Baptists stand for, and, uh, you know, and all those things. And we know what we believe, but sometimes I don't believe we know why we believe what we believe. If you were questioned about your faith, if you were questioned about your doctrine, do you have enough Bible knowledge? Do I have enough Bible knowledge to defend my faith? As Jude would say, we'll get to the book of Jude. He says that we're to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the same. Could you do that? Could I do that? That's what we're trying to do is equip you with truth because I'm telling you this storm of deception is coming. Heavenly Father, God, we ask you to help us tonight. And Father, as we get ready to have this invitation, Father, we commit it to you. You know the heart and minds of everyone in this place. And so, Father, we need you tonight. And, Father, I thank you that you've given us the presence of the Holy Spirit of God to lead us in truth, and you've given us your truth in written form in the Word of God that we hold in our hands today. And, Lord, it's the inspired, preserved, inerrant Word of God, and we believe that and are sure of that. And, Father, help us to stand upon truth. Help us to teach our young people the truth. Help us to teach our church the truth. And, Father, I pray that our people will have a heart and a mind to accept and receive truth and not just know what we're supposed to know, but know why we know and have a foundation for that. So God, help us in these days. And Father, may we be witnesses and lights to people who are looking for answers in this day of trouble. So God, help us, we pray. We commit the invitation to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll softly step to your feet, heads bowed, and eyes closed, we're just going to have an instrumental invitation tonight. God has spoken to your heart. Why don't you come? Maybe there's somebody you need to pray for. Maybe there's some things in your life you need to get right with the Lord. God knows your heart. If you want somebody to pray with you, you come and you let us know. We'll pray with you tonight. Maybe you're here, my friend, and you're not saved. Maybe you're tuning in by way of live stream tonight and you don't know 100% sure that if you die today that heaven will be your home. Oh, dear friend, listen tonight. It can be. This could be the day that changes the rest of your life. Accept Christ. Follow Him. Believe that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died for your sin. That he rose again and believe that he's coming again. If you'll believe that and you'll confess with your mouth and invite him into your heart and life, right where you're at, Christ will save you. 
My friend, if you're here in this building without Christ, please come. Let us show you that from the Word of God. Let us show you that you can see yourself what God says, that you can know Christ. Christian, this could be a new beginning for you tonight. Maybe you've messed up. Maybe there's some things in your life that shouldn't be there. Get it right tonight. It's not too late. I've been teaching to the young people on Sunday night that Peter messed up, but Jesus met Peter right where he messed up. And he came to him where he messed up, and he gave him a new start and a new beginning. Peter, God wasn't finished with Peter, and God's not finished with you. Give your heart to Christ. Give him now to the rest of your life to serve him and honor him. And I promise you, when you get to heaven, you won't regret it. When you look upon the face of that one who bled and died for you, who loved you enough to bear the scars of Calvary in his hand, when you look upon his face, you won't regret it. So why don't you come? As these are praying, you come. God's spoken to your heart tonight. Oh, be ready. Are you ready? Are your children ready? Do they know the truth? Oh, I encourage you to bring them to church and let us teach them and train them. But are you doing that in your home? I have to admit many times, as I said this morning, I fail in that category. I get so busy and caught up that I fail in my devotions at home with my family. But may God help us. The only thing to equip our children against this storm that Satan's getting ready to unleash is truth. And it's our responsibility as parents and grandparents to teach our children that. And it's our responsibility as a church to provide an environment for them to grow in the grace and truth of God. But are we doing that? Listen, we're coming to the end very quickly. And we'll ask her to play one more verse and then we'll be dismissed. If you have a need, you come tonight. Maybe you just have a burden. Maybe there's just some trouble or trial in your life. Just give it to the Lord. Cast all your cares on Him. For He cares for you. I'm glad that our Savior is not a Savior somewhere off that cannot be touched. But the Bible says that He's a high priest that is touched with the very feelings of our infirmities. And was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And she plays this song, Every hour I need thee. May we all be aware as the people of God that every moment of our lives we need Christ. You may be seated. I have a few announcements if you want to stay around for that. Continue what we did this morning on our announcements. I am not going to sing the anniversary song tonight, though, because I, I royally messed that up this morning. <clears throat> All right, but I never claimed that God called me to sing, so anyway. All right, a few announcements coming up now. Uh, we'll be back to regular schedule this Wednesday at 11 o'clock, uh, Bible study in the morning, and then at 7 o'clock in the evening. Now, uh, at least through the month of probably July, we're still going to just live stream all of our youth uh, services uh, this morning. Uh, or next Sunday morning, we're going to try to, to have... Uh, so encourage all the, the, the families and people you know that have children to bring them. We're going to try to, to devote a little portion of time uh, to them on Sunday school here in the sanctuary this morning. Uh, if we get a few more, uh, we'll try to do that next week. And so uh, be looking forward to that. Uh, we'll be preaching the same message twice on Wednesday. So you come whenever you're comfortable or come to both of them if you want to. Uh, you're stuck with me again. And so we're going to pick back up in the book of Ephesians Wednesday. Uh, and so uh, be doing that. Uh, and then next Sunday at 1.30, uh, we're going to have a regular Sunday school or regular 11 o'clock service. And then at 1.30, uh, you're all invited to meet with us down at, uh, at Camp Creek at the ballpark shel- or at the ball field shelter. And uh, so they've really kind of lifted all the restrictions now so that 100 people can gather under the, the thing and the bathrooms are open. So, But bring your chairs, bring your own food, bring your own drinks, bring your own utensils, all those things, and we're, st- we're not going to be sharing food and those things. So, uh, so uh, we're, we're going to honor that just this year. Things are kind of out of whack. I would encourage all uh, sixth graders and up uh, teenagers and even uh, adults to sign up for the virtual Arise. That sign up sheet's on the youth, uh, or on the Arise bulletin board, uh, just directly across from the youth bulletin board. And so we need to know uh, who's going to be here to feed them. Uh, June 21st, uh, we're going to have our uh, 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 morning service here with my, Brother Michael Hayes, Brother Russ Alvis, going to be teaching Sunday school. Uh, and then there'll be no evening service. Uh, Pastor and I is going to take the mission team. We're heading to Florida that morning. That's Father's Day. And so you go home and enjoy your fathers uh, that evening. 
And uh, let's see, what else am I missing? Uh, the uh, dollar for missions this, uh, this week, of course, uh, they've already counted the offerings for tonight. So what you uh, put in there from this time forward, as we told you this morning, is going to go to next week's offering. Uh, but the dollar for missions this week was for the Youth Missions Fund. And then, um, let's see, what am I trying to think of? The bus ministry, uh, the, the survival packs, the list out there is on the Youth Bullet Board if you want to donate to that. Uh, you can do that, the items that we need. That will be due by Wednesday, is that right, Jenny? Uh, this Wednesday if you want to give to that and so we're going to do some stuff for our bus kids we've not able to have service with and do a little something for them you could be a part of that if you want to uh, let's see what else am I missing out anything oh the master club training for our master club leaders uh, if you want to uh, join that look out on the master club bulletin board uh, there's a link there that you can do on June 13th at 10 a.m. if you want to view this online training it will be a great training uh, they're going to go through that yellow leaders manual that we kind of went through last year be a good refresher I know we've not been in club for a couple months, and so I'm going to try to watch it, uh, what I can of it. And so uh, we're going to try to get a uh, plan in by the next few weeks what we're going to do. And I plan, hopefully by the end of August, the 1st of September, to kick back off in full swing. And so uh, we've got to come up with a plan for that and have it in writing and all those things. So we're in the process of working on that. Uh, but, oh, yeah, and the 3rd through the 7th of August, we're going to have our family Bible school. We're going to have it here. Everything's going to be in the sanctuary. Everybody's going to sit with their families. We're going to have a lesson. We'll do some singing. And then uh, we might do like a money drive like we do for the missionaries every year. Uh, but what's going to be different, we're not going to stretch it out all night long. And we're going to have uh, snacks a couple of nights that's going to be sent home with you, with the kids. And then we're going to have crafts a couple of nights that's going to be sent home with the kids. And so we're not going to be doing things and, and uh, sharing germs here at church. You can share them at home. All right. All right. Did I miss anything, Miss Jenny? I can't believe I got it all right. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray, and uh, we'll be dismissed tonight. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the opportunity again to be in your house. Thank you for the word of God, and oh, what a blessing it is to our hearts. Father, thank you for your people. Give them a good week, and Father, till we meet again, God, we ask you to go before us and direct us. Be with our pastor as he's away. Give him rest that he needs this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.